markets in recent weeks and contributed to the surge in volatility diminished after data from the Labor Department was released Friday, which showed that wage growth slowed in February. Um, meanwhile, the annual wage gain in January, which initially came in stronger than expected and sparked jitters that led to the um, market's worst sell-off in, in more than two years, was revised down. So the data helped push stock futures up before the opening bell and moved indexes higher throughout the session and notched their third week of gains out of the past four. Of the 313,000 jobs that were added last month, 92,000 were in construction and man in manufacturing sectors, and another 50,000 were from retailers that were hiring. Uh, the unemployment rate remained at 4.1%, which was the lowest in more than 17 years, but average hourly wages only increased a modest 2.6% year over year, a number that should temporarily ease inflation worries. All the Although there was incredible growth in the economy, it didn't spook anyone with wages. So um, some more news Friday, uh, the NASDAQ climbed, topping its previous high in January. Uh, Microsoft, one of the largest NASDAQ components, edged above 96.717 um, buy point, but volume was unimpressive. And, um, but there was still uh, major growth stocks were in favor that day. And then the S&P 500 added 1.7 and made, made its first close above the important 50-day moving average since February 27th. And the Dow Jones kept pace with the other indexes, rising 1.8. But the Dow failed to top its 50-day line. Still, major stock indexes rallied strongly to the close. The net was all Friday. Um, airline, casino, tobacco, generic drugs, and data storage were some of the top industry groups. Uh, metal in, metals and mining stocks, including some affected by trade tariffs, were among the weakest. Department stores, man, supermarkets, RV, managed care, and apparel were others at the bottom of the industry performance table, um, which factored into one of our questions on the test. <laughs> the, um, on Monday, the Dow dropped 157 points, losing momentum with the sharp gains that followed the jobs report, and the NASDAQ jumped to a new record for the second straight day. Uh, the US government recorded a monthly budget deficit of 215 billion in February, up from 12% from the same month last year due to lower revenue and higher spending. So revenues were down 9% in February from the same month last year and taxes were 2% lower. Um, Spending was seven billion more than the same period a year ago. So the rise in spending was led by gains in military spending and for the aftermath of last year's hurricanes. Uh, the, degrees, uh, the decrease in withholding during the month is the earliest sign of the effect of the Trump tax cut, analysts said, and March could show an even steeper drop. Economists say that changes in taxes and increased federal spending are likely to boost growth in 2018 and, in 20, and into 2019, but the trend is towards a larger deficit. Uh, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, is set to release its latest estimate on April 9th. Um, let's see. The yield for the 10-year uh, U.S. Treasury changed very little since the passage of the Trump cap tax cuts last year, um, the 10-year benchmark yield has gained 41.5 basis points from 2.468%. Um, so then yesterday, Tuesday, U.S. dropped mostly fueled by declines in um, high-flying technology and financial shares. Uh, the major stock indexes turned lower in afternoon trading unable to hold early gains despite another tame reading in uh, consumer inflation before the, uh, before the open. Um, the consumer price index information came out um, and consumer inflation in February is, was another non-event as prices rose, overall, overall rose 0.2% um, and uh, with the core rate also up to 0.2%, both numbers masked expectations. Um, and the yield set or settle, um, the yield on the 10 year note settled Tuesday at 
2.8% down from 2.870 on Monday. Meals um, move inversely to prices. And then the last thing I was going to talk about was geopolitics. Um, as the central banks move further away from the post-financial crisis, monetary policies that have cushioned the multi-year bull run in global stocks, um, investors say geopolitics are set to have a greater impact on the markets than they have in the recent past. Um, one ec economic um, economist said, we've gone from a period where global central banks acted in an unorthodox, untested ways that had a big impact on global liquidity. As we move more toward, as we move toward a more normal interest rate environment, these factors are taking precedent um, than otherwise would have or wouldn't, wouldn't have. Um, one way to gauge the changing environment lies in the increased uh, market volatility after equity surged in historically calm fashion last year. Um, and S&P had moved at least 1% uh, up or down in 17 trading days so far. And that only happened eight times in all of 2017. It also represents the highest total of such moves through uh, March 9th since 2016, when there were 25 such days as China's market turmoil re reverberated around the world. Excluding 2016, the S&P has experienced its most volat volatile start to a year since 2009. And that was all I had for that slide. And Anita, I see John. <laughs> Anita, I'm here, believe, believe it or not. I was here. I'm sorry I'm late. Okay. I uh, had a little malfunction. It was my first online test, and I didn't do very well when it came to the technological side. Did I, Carol? Thank you for your patience. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, Carol? I hear you, can you just hear? fine. I hear you okay. just fine. Sorry, I was muted. I'm going to mute. All right, good. Um, I need a scotch, but I'm going to talk about what's in the news. Um, G's top executives miss out on cash bonuses for the first time, which I thought was uh, kind of amazing. Um, it kind of ties into, you know, agency and what's going on. And in past years, you've seen a lot of people, uh, executives parachute out with numbers that we only dream that we could have. Um, in this case, General Electric, for the first time in 125 years, didn't pay out the cash bonuses to its top executives at the corporate headquarters. Um, they withheld the bonuses and canceled some of the 2015 equity awards. Uh, and they uh, cited the conglomerate struggle, which I think is great. Um, not that they struggled, but that they did the right thing. Uh, and they were forced to slash dividends and thousands of jobs. So they held out uh, uh, on who they were giving their money to. Uh, former CEO Jeff Immelt um, received $8.1 in compensation in his last year, which was down from $21 million. Um, the, uh, they also ch were changing the compensation program for 2018. They're limited, eliminating the long-term cash incentive programs and lowering the amount of cash salary um, paid to the top execs. Um, it's tying its equity awards to total shareholder return, which I think is terrific. Um, and it will be broken up by operating businesses and only on those segments will you be, will you be judged. Um, Overall, GE funded uh, their corporate bonus pool at only 24%. Um, it, and everyone received la less than half than what they had served before. Um, they say they've also, beginning in, hello, beginning in 2018, um, they're going to have um, their metrics down to two portions. One's tied to the measure of earnings, and the other the measure of um, of cash. They used to also include uh, adjusted earnings per share, industrial par profit margins, and cash return to shareholders. So they're becoming very streamlined on how they're going to pay their, their top uh, executives. Um, then Barron's had something on how Amazon was rolling out the changes to 
Um, whole foods, uh, they're getting away from uh, the whole foods notion of, um, of uh, being the place for the best available food, um, regardless of what it costs, to more whatever makes you whole. Uh, it positions them, um, it was intended to make Whole Foods a more human place, according to Amazon. And some of the things they've gone about as they are now getting deeper into taking over Whole Foods is they've uh, had a number of price reductions, uh, which is putting pricing across the industry as grocers um, are worried about their margins. Um, but still, there's only about a 2% difference between the pricing at Whole, um, at, between Amazon and Walmart. Um, they're also um, offering other inducements, um, new credit cards. Um, they're offering uh, and door buster specials that are going out to um, uh, the special clients that they're trying to bring in. They're also, as you can imagine, they're expanding their 365 chain. Um, it, uh, it's all on their private labels, uh, which will give them a great chance to come up with some big data, some really big data for, for, uh, for who they want to target. Um, they also are expanding um, the, uh, let's see, the, um, uh, oh, they're, exp they're uh, expanding their presence in Amazon Prime in the stores, trying to sell uh, in a combination of both Amazon and Whole Foods. Um, they've also announced a two-hour delivery in certain markets. So they're really trying to put pressure on people like Peapod and those type of, uh, of companies um, as they go forward in the bigger markets that they do operate in. Um, one of the things that they did mention is that it is becoming harder for some of the smaller um, suppliers to be part of that program. Uh, as they are trying to consolidate, they're becoming more of a uh, just-in-time service provider. The people that make those special items that a lot of the uh, Whole Food uh, faithful went in for are having, a trouble, having trouble adjusting to the, uh, the model that's coming about. And then we talked about uh, T-Mobile uh, takes its biggest advantage stems from its bi biggest weakness. Um, T-Mobile, um, even after years of uh, industry-leading growth, uh, is obviously well behind uh, the Verizons of the world and the AT&T. And so what they've done is, um, they've, and what they've, their problem is, is scale. So what they've done is they're turning that scale from a weakness into a strength. Um, and they're doing it uh, by... Um, offering, um, they're offering services to their customers at prices um, that allow them to grow their scale and thus bring their uh, cost down, and yet are cutting into the market share of Verizon and AT and T, um, so that they're trying to maintain an average revenue, uh, but because their scale continues to grow, their profit margins are increasing. Um, they're doing it with things like uh, unbundling smartphone devices and service plans, remove it, removing music and video streaming um, from data caps. Um, they're switching to single unlimited data plans, uh, and they're including taxes and fees in their pricing, which I think everybody seems to be bothered by not knowing exactly what's in there. So it's all inclusive when you look at it. Um, it's, uh, they, they added that uh, more customers uh, sees them leverage uh, their fixed operating expenses, um, and, it, and it lets them increase their uh, flow in profits uh, to the bottom line and lets them reinvest to then go ahead and bring on more customers. So it's kind of self-perpetuating with what they're trying to do right now. Hey, John, keep yes. in mind, you're already at 20 minutes. For All right. Well, so, well then so speed up a little bit. Okay. Um, let's see. The, uh, the let's talk about uh, let's see this 
quite the rising yield. Let me make sure I got that. Oh, um, CVS is taking on a big bond issue uh, as they're looking to buy Aetna. But there are many, what's been said in the marketplace is that most companies are holding off right now uh, on issuing new debt. Uh, they don't feel that, although they think that there are interest rates coming, they are staying away uh, from taking a position like CVS. Uh, they think that they have a better chance um, to uh, hold where they are and yet uh, possibly bring in more debt long uh, deeper into the year. Um, the mortgage rates climbed to a four-year high. Uh, I'm sorry, to, yes, to a four-year high. And they were, the 30-year fixed uh, was up to 4.46% from 4.43 last year. And uh, the 30-year average uh, last year was 4.21. Um, and the 15-year is up as well from 3.9 to 3.94%. Um, slow, uh, uh, home purchases have slumped 3.2% from December to February. And the uh, pressure of uh, higher rates um, says that we may, um, and, and a lack of, uh, of uh, inventory says that interest rates may continue to uh, rise. Um, I'm going to, the, uh, the, the short on the Italian elections is they have put in place um, a group that is not friendly to the Eurozone, and they have taken, they have taken um, the position that they are um, not going to abide by some of the deals that uh, that the uh, that the eurozone has come up with, um, they expect that uh, they're going to have to deal with their debt problem here, and it's not like Greece, where which was a small country. Uh, Italy is the third largest um, uh, economy uh, in the eurozone, and we'll just have to see what happens with that. I think you all know that uh, Trump uh, nixed the uh, the uh, Broadcom deal for Qualcomm on uh, national security issues. And um, basically, they said that Broadcom has to move on. There is not going to be an opportunity for them to do so. Um, the Walmart and Weight Watchers part uh, that we had, I thought, was an interesting uh, grouping of brands. Uh, but it is not going to be a deliverable, such as a Freshly or, um, or a Blue Apron. Uh, you're going to be able to call it in any time from the morning up until 3 o'clock in the afternoon and pick it up that evening and take it home with you. Um, and last and not, last but not least, uh, as you all know, Tillerson was um, released as Secretary of State and replaced, but the markets had no reaction to it whatsoever. Go ahead, Anita. Our last slide was just um, some of the predictions, or um, actually it wasn't really predictions, it was the upcoming earnings releases. Um, that uh, we, Dollar General, Tiffany, Cor Oracle, FedEx, and um, General Mills that are coming out um, in the next week um, with their forecast. I thought something indicative of that was FedEx must have had a terrific Christmas. When you look at uh, what last year's was versus what they're predicting coming yeah, out. That's, that's pretty nice, uh, nice growth. So we'll see whether they hit it and how the market reacts. Good. Um, let's see, a couple of the things that you talked about um, that I thought was interesting. The tariffs, most definitely. You know, it's, a, it's sort of a double-edged sword with tariffs. Mm -hmm. Are we helping the steel and aluminum industry, and at what cost? So other products become more expensive in the U.S. We've had pretty low inflation, so higher prices on some products isn't the end of the world. But then you start looking at the global issues and the concern about other countries imposing different tariffs upon us. And so the, the impact on business could be, uh, could be quite devastating from, uh, from those tariffs. Um, you may have seen that Amazon bought Ring, that the, um, the doorbell company. And I found that one interesting. I, I live in the area up north of, of Baltimore, up in Hunt Valley, that had this rash of burglaries uh, earlier this winter. And they were, had like 30, they broke into about 30 houses in a very short period of time. And the police were meeting with us um, to talk about the status of the uh, of 
of their investigation. And they recommended those kinds of doorbells. They, they didn't say ring specifically. Well, well, they did, but they didn't say that's the only one to buy. Um, but if you think about where Amazon's trying to go, where they're pushing out on having it, dropping the packages right into your home and now acquiring that ring technology, it will probably allow them to move quicker on, uh, um, on, on beating others to, uh, to putting packages right into your home, which may help them long term. That one we'll keep an eye on. There's a lot of talk about they overpaid for Ring. Uh, Ring was a uh, Shark Tank company a few years ago, and at the time it was valued at about seven million, and they got a billion dollars for it. So that's that's a nice little price tag. Uh, Amazon can afford to overpay for things, and then again they may not have overpaid, but that's a lot of the talk on the uh, on the net right now. Anybody else have any any uh, news that they saw that was particularly interesting? I was glad to see Ricarlo get us started on uh, discussing last week's uh, review of the week, the one from when I was sick, when uh, when we had the presentation that was all virtual. And I particularly liked, I think Diana was commenting on uh, JCPenney and Sears and, and or JCPenney and Macy's and how that's changed. It's going to be interesting to watch Toys R Us failing because that is a specialty retailer that's going down. You start to watch Dick's Sporting Goods and see how they're doing. They, they didn't have a good fourth quarter. Some of these larger, all things for all people kinds of specialty firms are challenged because it's really am easy for Amazon or, or Target or Walmart to undercut them on, pri on price on toys because they can make up that margin in other, other specialty categories. Whereas, uh, you can't if you only sell toys. You can't underprice yourself um, and still and still hit your earnings numbers. So uh, I don't think that's the only specialty retailer that will go down. And on the other hand, certain very specific specialties are doing well. The, the, we talk about life cycles of companies. I think with specialty retailers, you particularly see that. There was a time when Abercrombie was this huge hot brand and then they really struggled. And so uh, just because you're hot for a period of time, continuing to reinvent yourself is difficult, which is part of the reason you had that Nordstrom question, see how they're going to, uh, they're going to do it. Okay, any, anything else on the markets?